My name is Beth Shapiro, and I run a research lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz, called the Paleogenomics Lab, and we extract DNA from plants and animals that used to be alive. The dodo was one of the first animals that I had the honor of working on when I started graduate school in ancient DNA. I worked at a place called the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and they have the only dodo that is anywhere in the world that has any soft tissue in it. And every day as I walked by the specimen, I became increasingly curious about whether if I just ground up a little bit of that famous dodo, if I could see its DNA and maybe even figure out what kind of a bird the dodo is. When I was in the middle of my PhD, I was finally able to go into the museum and take a tiny little piece of bone out of the Oxford dodo's leg. We were able to show using this DNA that the dodo is a type of pigeon. In fact, it's most closely related to a beautiful pigeon called the Nicobar pigeon. The Nicobar pigeon lives across the Indian Ocean on islands and is a really strong flyer. So it's particularly different from the dodo, which was just a big flightless bird that laid its eggs and nests on the ground. So we don't have any living dodos and we don't have any living dodo cells. So the first thing that we need to do is learn the sequence of the dodo's genome. We can do this by taking little bone fragments from dodo specimens that are in museums today. We grind them up and we extract the DNA and the DNA is not in good condition. What, when you're alive, are really, really long strands of DNA get broken down after death into smaller and smaller and smaller fragments until eventually there's nothing left. If I were to take DNA from cells in the inside of my cheek, they would be hundreds of millions of letters long. But the sequences that we get from the dodo remains that we're working with are maybe 30 or 40 letters long. So part one is a giant puzzle. We extract DNA, we have all of these tiny little puzzle pieces, and we have to figure out how to piece them together into the whole genome sequence of a dodo. We do this by comparing it to the genome sequence of a close relative, in this case, the Nicobar pigeon. So we have a really nice copy of the Nicobar pigeon's genome. We have all these little tiny puzzle pieces and we have to match them up using a computer, figure out where they go. It's not possible to bring a species back to life that is extinct. That is, it's not possible to create something that is 100% identical in every way to a species that's gone. But the technologies that are available to us today should make it possible to recreate extinct traits. This means that we could take the DNA sequence of a bird that's alive today and slightly tweak its genetic code a little bit at a time until it looks and acts a little bit more like a dodo. One of the benefits of creating something like a dodo to Mauritius is that we will need to take habitats on Mauritius and transform them into a place where a dodo might be able to survive. Dodos went extinct in Mauritius not because people ate them. In fact, the first written record suggested they tasted pretty gross, kind of greasy and unappealing. A dodo was a bird, a big flightless bird, that laid a single egg in a nest on the ground. They couldn't fly. This means that their eggs are really susceptible to predation by things like rats and cats and pigs and, and, and other, other animals that have been introduced to Mauritius. So in order to create a habitat where dodos could thrive today, we would have to clean up the ecosystem. And doing that would have tremendous benefits to other species that currently live on Mauritius. Mauritius has a fantastic track record doing conservation research. They've managed to save species like the Mauritian pink pigeon and reintroduce species to Mauritius like the Aldabran giant tortoise. We can't bring back a species like the dodo or any species that is extinct, but the technologies that we will develop as we work toward this goal will benefit species that are alive today. Habitats around the world are changing at a rate that outpaces their ability to keep up by natural selection. Our technologies, these new tools, make it possible for us to speed up this adaptive process to help species and populations and communities and whole ecosystems adapt to a rapidly changing planet to help create a future that is both biodiverse and filled with people.
My advice to students who look outside and think, oh my goodness, there's a lot going on out there that's bad, but I can be part of that solution. How do I do that? I'll say, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. You can do it by telling stories. You can do it by writing, by thinking, by creating. You can do it by becoming a scientist. And does that mean sitting in a lab and extracting DNA or learning about how to edit genomes? Maybe not. Maybe it means being an ecologist and learning about how species interact in ecosystems and how important it is to have redundancy in these ecosystems so that if something goes wrong, it can restabilize. Maybe it means thinking about fires and floods and weather patterns and climate. There are a lot of possibilities out there. Don't be afraid to take risks and discover something that you love.